Welcome to the Light Up Your Business podcast, the show where we dive deep into the world of small businesses. I'm your host, Tammy Hirschberger, and each episode will bring you inspiring stories, expert insights, and practical tips to help your small business thrive. Whether you're an entrepreneur just starting out or a seasoned business owner, this podcast is your go-to source for success in the small business world. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you back to another episode of Light Up Your Business. I am interviewing someone special today. Her name is Chris Karen, and she's the owner of Local Liquors. Chris, how are you doing today? Doing all right. Good. Well, I wanted to bring you in. Um, I specifically don't know a lot about the liquor business, uh, but I would like to learn some from you today. And then uh, we're going to talk about some issues that your business is facing. Um, a local, I think it's a law change, I guess you would say, that's kind of affecting your business. Pretty significantly. So that's the kind of stuff we want to talk about, because I want to get into the different businesses, the different things the government's doing to hurt our businesses, things that we can learn from each other about just growing businesses or starting a business. You're a female owner, which I love that about you. Um, I think females are amazing in business. And so we're just going to kind of dig straight in, okay? Perfect. Okay, so let's start off by, do you want to kind of tell me about your background? Um, so I started out at the University of Iowa real quickly, was an intern for a newspaper, got transferred from the newspaper into the billboard division in Denver, was 20 years selling billboards for um, probably six different companies, but never left my chair. Oh, wow. So it was... Uh, Gannett, Infinity, Viacom, CBS, just continual um, acquisitions and changes. Uh, the last I was there was I ran a three-state region, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado as their general manager, and then um, had some differences with the CEO and ended up leaving and starting a small business up in Silverthorne, which is ultimately where I always wanted to be, okay. is in the mountains. and. Mm -hmm. Silverthorne's a great combination of the Iowa land I grew up with and the mountains that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, and so we opened a company called Peak Provisions and it was a company that was designed, um, back up a little bit, I have two sons and we used to travel to the mountains all the time for, uh, one was a competitive skier and the other one just loved skiing. and. Um, we started this business that would stock condos for people on vacation and they would be oven ready easy to prepare meals as well as um, groceries in small quantities so that when you go on vacation you're not buying a bunch of stuff you're not having to cook as a mother you could actually enjoy your That's vacation idea. Um, awesome idea right mm -hmm. um, and then as part of that we opened up the liquor store and it was a small liquor store about about two, three blocks off of Main Street, 900 square feet. And um, that way we could also deliver when you got there, you could have a glass of wine or a, a cold beer after a long day of traveling, especially with children. Um, and that we struggled with that for years um, for various reasons. One, I think it was before its time. Mm -hmm. sure. um, we had to develop our own internet site, which was very expensive because nobody else was doing it. What anything. year did you say that was? 2005. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. So, you know, it, it was quite the endeavor. A great idea. It was just before its time, before mm -hmm. the Hello Freshes of the world yeah. and the, the pre-made <laughs> meals. But um, so basically what happened was after doing that for, we were in there four years in a small store and a larger um, location opened up over on the main street in Silverthorne. And so the town and the owner of the property came to us and asked us if we'd move the liquor store and become an anchor over there. Okay. So we moved the liquor store and the deli over there. And we created a deli that would also do the provisioning. Okay. Right. So you're trying to get income, you know, yeah. throwing spaghetti against the wall, sure. seeing what sticks. Um, was that scary going from a smaller space that was doing okay, but to growing quite that fast. I mean, it was huge. Yeah, it was huge. And did, I'll, can I'll be, I ask you how you overcame that at some point here? Because the I, fear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and it, it was tough, right? Mm -hmm. it, it took not only time and time away from my family, but also took a lot of money. And when we moved to the bigger location, um, the one thing I underestimated was inventory, right? And the cost of inventory. Yeah. 
we went from a 900 square foot location to an almost 4,500 square foot wow. location. We took 900 of, of it and made it a deli that would do the provisioning for people on vacation because that was an incredibly seasonal mm -hmm. business, mainly just during ski season. Um, but the cost of inventory and at, at the point in time where we moved, they made a major change to liquor laws, which was that we cannot be carried credit wise by any of our suppliers beyond 30 days. Really? So that's a, that was a law then? They that made it a law. Why is that in their business? Um, what was their reasoning? Do you know behind that? I think the liquor industry is just interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there's a lot of unsavory sure. people that in the years past through prohibition and everything else forward of, you know, so I think they were protecting, right? So that you didn't take a lot from your wholesalers and then never pay them for it. Um, I don't know. I don't know the reason. It's so interesting. It. But liquor laws are crazy. They're, they're super yeah, I want crazy. you to teach me a little bit about that because the thing is so unfair for what they're doing. You're a small business trying to make a living as a, a good human being, right? That's like trying to do it legally. And I think regulations kill businesses. I mean, they put so much stuff in place that it makes it so freaking hard with the taxes, the tax structure, the rules, the regulations. It's wild to me, but continue on. Okay, so uh, part of that conversation, right? Sure. Is So yes completely liquor is completely regulate, regulated you know especially when you go back to the old blue laws right yeah. um we were in business when they allowed sunday sales right okay but going back almost 80 years it has been in the state of colorado one entity one license one ability to negotiate okay right so i can only negotiate for my store I can only go to a supplier and say, okay, I want two cases of this because that's all I need. And they could only deliver, they would have to stay within that structure and say, mm -hmm. okay, you have a two case deal or you have a one case deal, things like that. And you know, you're, where you're talking about um, regulations and stuff, we followed these regulations and went into business based on one location, oh. one negotiation. You know, we have to pay in 30 days. Um, all that stuff. Okay. And what happened as of recent was there are laws in place, but they're not being enforced when it comes to the big companies. So you have to play by the rules, but the big guys don't have to. Correct. It's so messed up. Okay. I, and it, it's, it's seriously something that, that I personally, with the help of a lot of other independent liquor stores and, and some great people with an organization I'm on the board of, are really trying to fight because you have these huge corporations like Kroger and Walmart and um, Target, and they're negotiating on a national level. Mm -hmm. But because they're outside the state of Colorado, Colorado doesn't enforce it. So, for example, I am required to buy, it, to get a certain price level, I'm required to buy 65 cases. Well, they're only delivering one case to Kroger, yeah. and they're getting that price level. So I can't compete. I'm paying a higher price for the same product. But you're having to buy a lot more of it, which is so much overhead for you. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it takes your money. I don't have the space for it. I mean, I wouldn't buy 65 cases of Boda box yeah. wine. It just makes no sense. And that's because their headquarters is out of state? Is that what you're telling me? Correct. Is there a way around that? Could you find some way to have a headquarters, the tiniest of offices out of state and get around that law? But it still wouldn't do me any good unless I got everybody else in the independent mm -hmm. liquor industry okay. to, to go with me to yeah to try to go together and buy. You know, and there's all sorts of other things. Like, it's illegal for us to sell anything under cost, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what the grocery stores are doing is they're negotiating at a national level for lower pricing than we are. But then they're requiring manufacturing coupons. So that instant coupon you get on your mm -hmm. bottle of wine when you go to Kroger, that's taking it below cost. So they're allowed to do that? Right. Okay. They're doing it by doing it on a national level, getting a lower price, and then because they're using manufacturer's coupons as opposed to setting that as the price, mm -hmm. they're being able to sell it for under cost. Well, I can't survive that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They can raise the price of your eggs. They can raise the price of your milk sell you wine as cheaply as they want to to get you into that habit to put the independent liquor store out of business yeah and then they got the business then yeah. they got it they got the market 
So how do you start to fight that? What is the, what level, I mean, because obviously you have to get to the top, but where, where are you guys starting? What's the, tell me about the group that you have put together. So it's, a, it's an organization called Colorado Independent Liquor Stores United. Okay. And it's, um, it's an organization of independent liquor stores. And we, we're not as strong as we could be, mm-hmm. and we're definitely working on it, but it's like herding cats. Yeah. You know, mainly because everybody is an independent owner. You know how busy you are. Yes. Right? No time. And to get involved takes a lot. Um, and so you can't, you can't fight them from the top, mm-hmm. right? You, you, can, you can't necessarily fight them from a state level because their legal departments are too huge. So even if you go after them for some of these law violations or what I consider a law violation, their legal departments will tie up the state yeah. of Colorado and cost taxpayer money. And they have the money to, to do that where you guys or people like me, we don't, we'll run out of money before we can win. Oh, I don't so, have, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> we have to keep our money in our business. <laughs> well, yeah. you have to keep the money flowing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, and then you, you have the point where we're making less money, that the value of my business is down mm-hmm. way, even if I wanted to get out. Yeah. Because they've drawn the, they've taken that huge wine industry. Um, but it's, and it's all at a national level. Mm-hmm. I mean, the interesting thing about it is, and working really hard on legislation, right? And trying to get legislators involved in understanding that all we want is an even playing field. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. We, I'll, I'll beat them on quality selection, customer service atmosphere everything but yeah i can't if i can't beat them on and and i don't blame the consumer to a large degree yeah right everything's so expensive so you're the group that you're in what what is your plan like what what if or if there's people listening here that are you know that own a liquor store or want to get active and help what can we do to help you I mean, we're small business owners, so I understand we're not all in your field, but what can we do? Because this stuff pisses me off. I mean, it's like I get tired of the government screwing the small guy. Small business makes up most of the economy, believe it or not, and they just they squeeze the crap out of us. So, And I don't necessarily entirely blame government. Mm-hmm. I think it's huge corporations. I think it's corporate greed that's actually... But don't they go back to these senators and the people making the damn exactly. decisions? That's yes. what makes me mad. They get bought off. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I do blame, yes, I, I blame no, them. I, gr- but, I agree with you in that sense. But unfortunately, completely. we're stuck with these people that we're voting in that are not watching your back as a small business owner. But I don't think that they, they, they don't get it. I can't, mm-hmm. I can't grease their palm, right? Yeah. I, can't, yeah. I can't promise them that I'm going to contribute to their next campaign. Yeah. To, we're to too be, small we don't have the money for it correct so what do you think what's your idea or what's your group's idea of how would, how do we get around this stuff honestly yeah. education mm-hmm. right so so even though we are the liquor industry it's it's pretty much true for every small business is that like if you take our business alone the reason that the colorado wine industry is so vibrant the reason that the colorado um, um craft beverage industry mm-hmm. is so vibrant right not only the distilleries but the breweries the wineries the tourism that comes from that um, once you look at that level and then what supports that right it's the farmers that grow the peaches it's the it's the guys that grow the barley and the hops that are sourced locally mm-hmm. it's the people that they employ it's the wholesalers that bring it to us it's the truck drivers they employ it's the it's the people in the tap rooms and the tasting rooms all of that exists because of the independent liquor store yeah because when a great example that i always use is breck distillery okay when they first got in business and they're big now right they're everywhere yeah but when they first got in business in breckenridge i remember them coming to the door and saying can you just please put three bottles of bourbon on your shelves and see how it does and there was enough of us independent liquor stores that gave them a chance whereas if they would have gone to Kroger headquarters. They'd been turned down. They'd been turned down. Yeah. And they'd be like, no, Jack Daniels is in front of you. And Brown Foreman has got it covered. So mm-hmm. we got, you know. They, yeah. So that's the first thing that we need to educate people on is it's not whining independent liquor stores that the big guys are coming after, right? Yeah. We're an entire economic, um, I don't know how you would say it, 
but economically, we're incredibly important to the state of Colorado. Well, you're a force on yourself because you are what makes up the economy, right? I mean, that's standing with small business. We are, now the big names, Kroger, like you said, these big companies get all the recognition because they have 5,000 employees or whatever they have, right? But they forget how much of small business is what makes this country. Most people are employed by small business. And we don't, people don't know that because you just hear Apple, you hear Google, you hear these huge names when they employ tons and tons of people. But the problem is those companies, you know, they have a little movement in their stock and things change a little bit and they fire a ton of people. We're not firing 300 people at one time. You know, we maybe only have 10 people or 20 people or 30 or whatever you have, but we're making a, enough of us make up the economy in the area, right? And we right. care about the local state, the local community, the people. Exactly. Right? Well, and you know, I will rather go to each one of my employees and say, I tell you what, let's cut a couple hours. Yes. Let's get our, back on our feet and, and then we'll go from there. Or you'd go by attrition, right? Yeah. Some amazing, um, and I may get these numbers off sure. a little bit, but in 2022, Kroger reported 15% stock increase. Their, um, they made $14.4 billion and they fired 25,000 people. So they're making way good money and they're laying off people, which they're, hurts the local people. I mean, right. whatever community they're in. Exactly. The, um, I have a friend that works at Kroger and she's been there 34 years and makes $25 an hour. Wow. We did the math and the CEO of Kroger makes $9,400 an hour, an hour, right? Isn't it mind blowing? <laughs> I mean, I'm all for capitalism as far as making money. That's how we're in business, to make money to have, because money brings time, right? And we only get so much of it. And so I want to make money so I have more time to help people in my community, help the people I care about, help my family, help my employees. But I also, while I'm doing that, I'm taking care of my employees. Because I don't know how you feel about that, but for me, these guys, I think I have seven of them total, they are my family. I mean, I know legitimately not all of them are blood, but to me, they spend more time with me than their own family. I want them to be taken care of. And that's why I will bust my back to make sure they have a job, that they get the raises, their families are taken care of. And then you have these companies like Kroger, Apple, all of them, that are just dumping people by the minute because the stock changed and their, their big wigs aren't getting enough money in their pocket anymore. Yeah, well, and that, because most of them are income stock, stock driven, right? Yeah. So the, the CEO of Kroger makes two million a year, but he has 19,000 in wow. stock options, or 19 million in stock options. Think of so, the profit there. Well, and think of how driven he is by just the stock price, not the fact that, you know, one of the employees, her husband maybe just lost his job yeah. and she needs to be able to keep her job or she's yeah. been there 25 years or she, you know, doesn't know anything else or he, it's, the whole thing is crazy to me. Yeah. Right. So you said education. So that's kind of what this platform can help you do is get it out there. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask him, we'll keep going on this, but if there's anyone listening here that wants to help, can be a help, has any ideas, is there, what's the best way to get them ideas or people to you? To get them to your group that you're, you formed or? You know, I guess talk to your local liquor store, Okay. right? You've got some here in Grand Junction that are, that are pretty involved in what we're doing. It, and mainly talk to your representative. Okay. Because what they may be driven by money, right? Mm -hmm. But what we have to realize as people is they are more driven by the vote. Yep. Right. Yep. Because, and if if the what was really kind of crazy to me is that um, when we we just introduced a bill down in Denver, one three seven three, and it became a partisan issue, and. Small business is not a partisan issue. It's a bipartisan issue, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. The survival of the of the farmers that produce the product that we that the distillers use, that the coffee that's brewed to put make the coffee vodka, the the local employee, that's bipartisan. Yeah. In my eyes. Yeah. Right. And so we need to reach out to everybody that we can, and make them aware that it makes a difference whether it's a farmer or a, tr a, a truck driver or, you know, um, the commercial workers union that works for these grocery stores that, so another thing that the, the grocery stores are doing is they demand um, labor okay. from the wholesalers. So I have, to, I have to stock my own shelves, right? I have to place my own orders. Mm -hmm. I have to do all that well and, and legally I'm supposed to be doing that okay? because they're not supposed to provide free labor. It's, been, it's always so been So they can't the have their truck come in and stock the shelf for you. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Um, more importantly, they don't. 
right? Yeah. Um, but these large corporations are demanding it, that if you want your product on the shelf, you have to come in and stock it, just like they do to the Frito-Lay guy that's an independent business person, mm -hmm. that, you know, the Bimbo Bakery guy, the uh, Hostess, all those guys are stocking their own stuff. You go into a grocery store and it's not even their own employees anymore. And yet they're requiring that you do your own. Mm -hmm. So is that a law or they're just demanding that as? They're demanding it and we can't get it. We're too small, we're too independent, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't, it, yeah. and again, it's, it's, you see it again and again from a corporate level, right? They, um, the uh, Justice Department just went after Kroger and Walmart, maybe, for demanding supply chain during COVID. Oh yeah, okay. Right, so mm -hmm. they, went to the, they went to the suppliers and said, okay, Nabisco, you can't you can't support Tom's over in Hotchkiss or Peonia, right? I need. So they get demand. They get the the uh, inventory first goes to them, and if right. there's not enough, too bad to you. Exactly. Okay, so the 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 ball field, the game here is so unfair. <laughs> you said you've been in business how long? Uh, how many years? Uh, I've been in the liquor and business for probably since 2005, 2005. so almost 20 years. I mean, I'm not a big drinker myself, but just for the little bit I do when I go golfing and things like that, like I'm, it pisses me off now. Now I'm going to make sure I go to an independent because I didn't even know all this stuff was happening. So, well, cause I don't think it's right. I mean, to me, it should be even, I understand life's not fair, but in business, we have to, as people that support local business and you want those jobs, you want the people in the community and you want fair pricing. Cause once you're all gone, you know what they're going to do. They have a monopoly. They're going to raise prices. Correct. So we have to watch that. We have to protect that. Well, and not only are they going to raise prices, but they'll continue their alliances with national companies. Mm -hmm. So you may go into a liquor or a grocery store right now and find one or two Colorado wines. I didn't even think about that. The local stuff you're not going to get. No. Yeah. Th those those things will disappear. I you know I carry Savage Spectrum, the Storm Cellar. I carry as many, you know, Colorado wines as I can. One is they're delicious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And to every different taste level, but. It also is supporting the economy from beginning to end in the state of Colorado, which I, I truly believe in. So it's really a true trickle down effect. Cause I didn't even think about that aspect that like, they're going to determine what brands you're going to get. Cause whoever's, you know, kicking in the best feed to them is going to get it. And so you're losing options. Your choices are being taken away mm -hmm. literally. And then you're actually hurting your community even more, like you said, because you're not getting the local people, the local stuff. I mean, I've, I've talked to people since COVID and we've, I think that helped in some ways because it showed people like we need these local companies. We want local grown beef. We want locally sourced things because nationally it becomes a freaking mess in the supply chain. Correct. And then two, it hurts the local people. I mean, COVID shut so much down that so many businesses lost their business and so many families got so hurt by that. If we can stay local, we can physically drive there and still get the stuff. Correct. I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but. No, I truly believe that. I, but, uh, you know, and it goes, it, it, the law of supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. So the so the people in Peonia and Hotchkiss weren't getting their groceries because these huge corporations demanded that all their stores in large, you know, metropolitan areas got all the groceries. Well, yeah. where's that fair? Yeah. Um, but it it is, and I think that we need to look at. So I I just met you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But you're in the business of custom storage heads. Storage yeah. heads, right? Yep. So. You've got millers, you've got, you know, people that supply your wood, you've got, mm -hmm. you know, all those people that the, the, that are affected within the economy. Yeah. And what, and yes, there are people that work for Nabisco, there are people that work for Kroger and that kind of thing, but they don't, they're not treated like I treat. My, yeah, exactly. And, and you treat yeah. our customers and employees, right? Yeah. The self-checkout versus the non-self-checkout, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, that mess. Yeah, the wait a minute. Don't I get a discount for checking myself out and bagging my own groceries? You spring your bags. Do you have to do the bag fee? Because that thing pisses me off, That the Colorado bag fee. Do you have to pay for, or mm -mm. charge for bags? No. Okay. In, in, uh, in Silverthorne, it, it, the large corporations do. They saw it uh -huh. a little bit. Um, we don't. Small companies don't. So Lowe's okay. does. So there's Target a cutoff does. to where they require. And I understand the like the environmental, is. I'm not even talking about that. What pisses me off is, well, we're going to talk about this now because it's my show. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the fact that we're sitting here and let's just pretend like you had to do it. Okay. So you're buying the bags. 
I, I highly doubt they're reimbursing you for those bags because I'm paying the money straight to the state. Because like, it's like the delivery fee here. I have to charge that stupid 28 cents going to 29 cent delivery fee on every shed I or a set, you know, move or shed move I do or whatever. Well, and how much does that cost you in accounting fees? Well, it's more than I'm paying them, which is the <laughs> stupidest thing. And it's just another damn fee they're charging, like these bag fees. So I'm looking at I'm like, the state's paying the government for these bag fees. I'm pretty sure the government's not reimbursing them for the bags they're buying. So now the government's making money on your bags that you're buying which then becomes a hassle to me because I always forget my damn bags in the car. So I have to push the damn cart out there because I'm stubborn and I'm not buying their bags. Or but, just try to juggle everything. Yeah, it's a freaking nightmare. So it makes me mad though. I'm like, why does the government, if anybody should be getting the money, it should be the people get the money for buying the bag and then maybe they pay a fee on it. It's all stupid to me. But it's again, the government doing overreach and then letting these big corporations, like they're like, okay, we'll do it. I, it won't be long before they trickle that down to you guys, I promise. They're going to screw you somehow. What? Well, yeah. It ultimately yeah right is if you can get the money um yeah i don't know we haven't had to deal with that well, thankfully but the delivery <laughs> fee the 29 yeah. cent delivery fee on the one or two weddings do you do deliveries on your booth like uh, is there rules because i know i've heard some people around here that they say oh i get it delivered i didn't know that you could do that but so in the state of colorado you could deliver but you have to use your own employees your own vehicles and um it has to be done under your company, which in all honesty is very smart mm -hmm. because the fact is that, um, this so you is, wouldn't Uber it or something like that. Like well, that, that's and, what you're saying. And what were that, that was one of the uh, propositions that had come up back in 2022, um, that, that Uber drive. So if I deliver to, to a party and there's a 24 year old man standing there and about 18, Oh, okay. 20 year olds behind him. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deliver to him. I can lose my license. So does that, um, it's like being in a bar and you get overserved or you get serve someone that gives it to a, a young underage person. I've heard you can get sued for that. Is that same thing for like a liquor store? Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Yes. So how, we, there's that scary regulation. How do you even, so do you offer that service to deliver? We deliver mainly because of, um, because of manpower and because of, yeah. Uh, the situations you're delivering to, right? Yeah. If the guy calls me for a six pack of beer because he's too drunk to drive to my store <laughs> to, to buy a six pack yeah. of beer, I don't want anything to do with yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but we'll deliver weddings and reunions and, okay. and things like that. Um, and when it comes to delivery, I think it happens a lot in the cities and it, probably in sure. Grand Junction and stuff. But by keeping that chain of command and not allowing a third party in to deliver, mm -hmm we we have taken responsibilities we our license depends on us doing it safely our license depends on us having control over that liquor and understanding that if i serve to somebody too young if i even if i serve to somebody of age if i know he's serving to somebody too young i'm responsible okay. if i serve to somebody intoxicated i'm a, i'm responsible for that but the uber driver can be like because no repercussions, right? Uber doesn't carry a liquor license. I always think about this stuff because it's interesting because AM is not my field, but like I was online the other day and like I said, I'm really not a big drinker, but I saw you could order, I don't, I don't think it was Amazon, but through someone you could order your booze. I Amazon. Yeah, I don't like them either. Anyway, you could order the booze and then UPS would show up and I was like, how the hell does this work? So I'm just curious. So I'm looking around, you have to like show your, you have to scan your ID in and it proves you're old enough or whatever. But I was curious because I never finished it because I didn't need it delivered, but does then UPS check your ID again to make sure? Because you know they dump it at the front door. Any any idiot can pick up your package. That's a problem. That's what I'm curious about. It's like, where is the safety in that? Only because I don't believe in underage drinking. I don't believe if you're a severe alcoholic and you don't need any more, you don't need any more. You know what I mean? Yes. So I'm curious your perspective on that. Um, it, well, first of all, it, I believe that it's completely against the law. Get, okay. Right? Yeah. So there's not supposed to be third-party liquor delivery in the state of Colorado. Um, and there are some people that want it, but it, it, the controls aren't there. And the UPS yeah. driver isn't gonna stand there and wait for, for you to come with your ID and show up. And it, there's just, there's not enough safeguards. Yeah. <clears throat> and I okay. will tell you too that, to your point of someone that's an alcoholic and can't control themselves, you know, we are a controlled substance. Yeah. Okay? We're we're a lot like marijuana we're we are a, we are a lot like pharmaceuticals we are a controlled substance because 
to the true the name of it some people can't control yeah right so they need to we need to control it so because they can't yeah and so the other thing that you have going on in the industry is that when you put liquor throughout grocery stores wine and liquor Mm -hmm. so and you encourage um purchase by putting it at the at the checkout you encourage purchase by putting it every every aisle you encourage it by saying if you buy six bottles we're going to give you 20 percent off Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways that's not responsible right so that so the person that that doesn't want to be exposed to alcohol now cannot not be exposed to alcohol sure she's got to go to it's in your face yeah Yeah. you have to eat yeah right you got to go buy the eggs which are in the back (laughs) of the store that they make you walk all the way back um you also have theft and what's what we've seen and what we're seeing across the the state is that um again it's it, it, the more i got into it the more complicated the whole issue becomes so let's take self checkout okay right mm-hmm. you have taken back in the you're probably not old enough but back in the old days there were two people in every department right and okay. when the store got busy uh, two people from produce to yeah. check out, two yep. people from meat department to check out. And so those people w- that were working in their departments would come up and check out for the time being that they're busy and go back. With self-checkout, you now have six to eight less employees in that store that are watching that product. Yeah. Right? And so you have kids that are coming in and pocketing it's true. all the, you know, we've heard stories of kids coming in and taking bottles of wine and putting it in their water bottle and walking out oh really and, and then these stores have no chase policies right is Which that I a thing understand. is that a rule here at all in the state because i've heard that? stories of like california where they can't they can't even stop them they just have to well i have to imagine it is a thing because i know my husband goes to lowe's all the time to buy materials and they the guy there was telling him that every single day this guy comes in with a backpack he loads it with tons of dewalt tool i mean very expensive stuff loads it full and walks right out the door he does it every day and they can't do anything about it which i understand as like you don't want your employees getting hurt chasing them so if you have loss prevention or something great but it makes me mad that that's even allowed because people like us are going to pay more money for the stuff that i am legally paying for because i'm trying to buy the you know i'm trying to do it the right way correct those freaking tools have to be paid for that are being stolen so like, is there specific rules that you've heard of in this state or it's just more of a safety issue you don't wanna? My understanding is most of the large corporations have put this into effect, not okay. necessarily because of, so, so like if I had, if I had a store and, and no offense to anybody within mm-hmm. the area, but if I had a store, let's say in a bad part of Aurora, yep. I'd probably have a no chase policy. Just for safety. Silverthorne, chase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes well, sense. You know, we don't we don't necessarily do that. But in silver, no, we aggressively go after them. Yeah, right. Whether it's putting them on tape, calling the police, telling you know, testifying against them, giving evidence. No, we. It's stealing. You're stealing yeah. from my employees. You're stealing from my customers. You're stealing from my family. Yep. Right. And you're setting an example, which I get what you're saying about the community. If it's a bad area and you're probably going to get shot over, it's not worth it. Correct. But you also might want to rethink what you're doing there in business because you're going to die because you're going to starve to death because they will keep stealing from you. Correct. Yeah. You know, but these large corporations that have one store that's in a good area, one store that's in a bad Mm -hmm. area, one store that's, you know, they have to make blanket policies. So the huge corporations like a Lowe's, like a Walmart um, and, and a Kroger, they have no chase policies. And an interesting quote from the, um, so back when, uh, Walmart and somebody else were talking about having to close stores because of the theft, Yeah, right? The Lowe's CEO came out and said, one of the reasons why our theft percentage is so low, he's like at 1% and everybody else is now oh. verging on three to six, um, is because I have people in the aisles. I can pay a person to stand in the aisle. Interesting and save money over how much is going out the door not being paid for. So just having someone in the aisle deters th- thieves, basically. Right. Interesting. We, somebody sketchy comes in the store, one of my employees will just start stocking right next to where they're shopping, uh-huh. right? And they're it not, deters them. Uh-huh. So it's, it's more of, but if, if these, especially when you get into areas, um, and again, there's so much involved in it. Yeah. So when they went to automatic wine conversion, when they said, the, the large company said, okay, if we sell beer, now we can sell wine. One of the things that was not part of the program was that um, if I wanted a liquor store, I can't put it within 500 feet of a school. 
Oh, okay. A, a high school, okay. parochial school, daycare, anything, right? Mm -hmm. And so automatically, these people that had three, two, then had full strength beer and then full strength beer wine, but they're within, they didn't have to do the, the distance requiring from high schools. So a lot of what these companies are seeing is high schoolers coming in and, and taking a bunch of stuff out of the store, knowing there's no chase policies. Um, it, it's, it's just crazy. So they know where to. So you're making it easier for these young kids to get this stuff, which is kind of defeating the purpose of what, what you're trying to do. I mean, it's a control. which is drink responsibly, right? right. It's I mean, there, beer, in my opinion, all that stuff is not evil. It's when you have an addiction to it and it becomes too far. Or when young people are getting it and being very irresponsible with it and making bad decisions. So Correct. Let's throw on top of that spiked Sunny D, spiked Mountain Dew, hard Arizona tea. So oh. they're, they're late. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're marketing to you. kids. Yes, that's the word. That's right? The and then these grocery stores, yeah. you, you walk by a hard Mountain Dew display and you can't tell the difference between regular Mountain Dew. Other than the hard And you think about that, it's a great, I mean, for them, it's a great tactic because you're, I mean, what mom doesn't know, their kid's toting along in the thing and the kids are always grabbing everything. And here they are seeing these things that they usually wouldn't see because they'd be in a liquor store. Right. That's, I, don't I, didn't, let, see, I didn't even think about that. I don't let an un unaccompanied teenager or minor in my store. Yeah. If they're with their parents, right, all day. But I also don't have a huge display of Mountain Dew next to Hard Mountain Dew. I have Hard Mountain Dew, but yeah. I don't because I don't believe in it. Yeah. But uh, like Arizona tea, right? I'll have Hard Arizona tea, but it's not right next to the Arizona tea. Yeah. There's not that leap. Yeah. For the, I didn't the, even think about the mental leap there and how clearly it's in their face. I mean, I'm not a parent, but if I was, I would think about that now because it's very interesting how much they're pushing this stuff on children. It's crazy. I mean, same thing with pot, which we won't get into, but it's like, I mean, an adult on pot, great. If it calms you, whatever. But like you're giving it to these kids or they're getting it and they're wanting it at such a young age, they're becoming addicted to it. And then before you know it, it's just like another thing they want and then it grows into worse stuff, right? right? And their minds are developing and it's not a... It's, it's not, not a healthy situation. For it. Yeah. Right? And it's not, and most often it's not in a controlled situation. Yeah. In the state of Colorado, legal, legally, your 18-year-old can drink at home with you. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But in my eyes, that's a controlled situation where yeah. you take that whole um, mystique and everything out of drinking. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, yeah. it's like, no, you can have a beer. Yeah. That's it. And now we've made it so, these corporations have made it so easy to drink with, you know, tea and the seltzers and, you know, when I was growing up, it was Bud, Bud Light, and boy, <laughs> yeah. choked down three of those. <laughs> yeah, I was never a beer drinker because I hated the taste. And that actually, that is actually really true because, you know, I, I have an alcoholic father. So, you know, I have a little bit of a, a fear of it, a healthy fear, if you will. And that was the other thing I always liked about, like you said, now they've sweetened everything up so much. I can actually drink a little bit because I'm like, oh, that's not so bad. Back then, I didn't drink beer. I didn't like the hard stuff. It was so strong. I'm not a shot person, but that would be the only way I could have done it because I was like, this stuff is nasty. I cannot stand the taste. <laughs> and so it never, it made it easy for me knowing I have an alcoholic father. Like, I mean, he's past it now, but when he was younger. But anyway, so it was like, I don't want it because it's disgusting. And now, like you said, they've sugared it up. They've added so much different options to it. And, and they've made it, like my son, it, I had Sunny D in the refrigerator his entire I didn't even use. realize they had spiked that now. Oh yeah, they're spiking everything. It's crazy. You You're know, opening so our eyes to everybody's <laughs> listening here. I'm going to have to be careful. I'd probably get myself on something like, what is this? This is interesting. <laughs> it's like I said, it's a crazy industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're just, it, it goes, so it, let's go back even further. Yeah, all right. Sure. That to get something on the ballot, you talk about government, to get something on the ballot requires millions of dollars. Yeah. Because you have to, the, the state of Colorado has made it legal to hire somebody to get the signatures to put something on the ballot. But the amount of signatures that you have to get and the distribution, which I think is a, a, a great thing because that's a whole other subject, but the, the fact that you have to get, get signatures from the south of Colorado, from the western Colorado, okay. from all over the state to get something on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But 
we can't come up with $2 million to just get something on the ballot. Yeah. Like when they made this change, they spent $31 million on propositions 124, 125, and 126. We, as an industry, the independent liquor stores and, and, and some of our uh, associates and affiliates and everything, we had $975,000. Wow. And you asked me earlier about how to get it done. It was boots on the ground. Yeah. It was everybody in the industry talking to somebody and letting them know the repercussions of third party delivery, legalizing it, letting DoorDash deliver liquor. It was um, letting people understand what the repercussions were of allowing as many liquor stores as you want, whereas right now I'm limited. If I wanted to own three, I could own three, but it opened the door for huge corporations. Yeah. But it's every person talking to everybody, and the voters came out, right? But it's, it's so difficult in the state that if you want to make a change, you have to have money. So therefore, the only people that can make changes people are money. the people with the money. Yeah. And then they make more money, and then they can make more changes to your government by, like you said, yeah, contributing to campaign funds. And even for someone like us, it takes, even if we can figure out the people and the, it takes time to create these armies of people to go out and start petitioning this stuff and getting the petition signed and all that stuff. So I think it's good that you came on here because you're teaching me a ton of stuff that I didn't know. You can believe my fat mouth is going to tell everybody I know about <laughs> it. And I hope everyone listening goes and talks to people because whether you're a drinker or not, whether you're a parent or not, it's, it's affecting the communities. It's affecting children. Like all this stuff, I did not even put my mind to that thought of like, we're actually hurting children because we're, we're pushing it on them younger and younger. Now, there is nothing wrong. Like I said, I'm not here saying there's anything wrong with drinking, but as long as you do it responsibly. Correct. Pushing it on children and making them think it's cool and making it so accessible to them, especially in an uncontrolled environment, is not safe. No. And that's where I think it gets into the gray area of like, this can become a serious problem for those kids. I, I think it is. And it's it goes back to, to, to the alcoholism. Yeah. You see it, yeah. right? I, I, there are people that I won't serve. You know, I, not only if they're, they come in and they, I can tell that they've been drinking, but there are certain people within my community that I've just pulled aside and said, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this, yeah. right? I don't, I don't want to make it easy for you to do this anymore. So you yeah. can't come in my store anymore. See, and that's why we need the small businesses like yours, because you care. Where Kroger is never going to go up to anyone and say, you can't have that. Right. You can't do that. I don't right. want you to hurt yourself anymore. Whatever I've, it is. Right. I've yeah. seen the life situation you're in and it's a bad decline and, and I, I need to help you out of this. Right. Yeah. If nothing else, by not serving you. Well, and this third party stuff came up to me. I won't get into too many details, but I know someone that their, their significant other is at the moment. It's getting better, but they were a severe alcoholic in bad shape. And um, he kept trying to stop them from getting it. And because she was drunk all the time, she couldn't go get it because she wasn't driving, thankfully. And so she was, he was trying to sober up. And unfortunately, she during COVID, she found a way to get it delivered to her home. And it just continued the cycle. Mm -hmm. And it was so devastating because it was like he was making headway. And then it's like, oh, now we can have it delivered. Now they can get it without leaving. They don't have to drive. I mean, thankfully, we don't want drink, you know, drunk drivers on the road. But it was just a sad state to me because I thought, man, this opens up such a mess. Right. But as an employee of a liquor store, if they're the ones doing the delivery. Yeah they're responsible for when they open the when that person opens the door to sign off on it because they have to check ids if they're intoxicated or if they are in a situation where you don't think that they should be served you should be walking away yeah because it's our license it's our livelihood so i mean i'm glad that there is some protections in place with you guys i would imagine there's some unresponsible business owners out there i mean they're everywhere but I am glad for people like you that are responsible with it because you're doing the best you can as a person, as a business owner in your community to protect your community. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I think that there are a lot of responsible ones, but like you said, there's, yeah, there's, there's a bad apple in every barrel. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. But you try, you try to protect as many good apples as you can. Yeah. You try to protect the people that are taking care of people. It's, that's what a community does, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's part of why I want you on here, because especially when I heard about what you're facing, I mean, I didn't know that at the beginning. I just thought this woman's going to have a cool story. But <laughs> we want to help each other as business owners because we need each other. Mm -hmm. The state needs us. The people in our communities need us. And we don't even know all the people that we affect with our business and what we're doing and as people and as examples to people being an entrepreneur and a female business owner. And so I appreciate you coming on here and talking about that. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Again, it's... 
it, it's education. Yeah. Well, and that's what we need because that's how we get woke up. I mean, I feel like COVID that did that to a lot of people. We started to wake up and I'm watching school boards and what's happening in schools. And I'm like, people are starting to get it. Like our kids are being inundated with crap. And if you're not careful as a parent, this stuff is going to get into them and it changes them. And so I think it's good to always be watching whatever side of the fence you're on, just be educated with what's happening. So you are aware. And if you don't like it, then you have to do something about it. Right. And I don't want to get into a political discussion. Yeah, no, but, but the, the, one of the things that people need to realize that's incredibly important is you need to be involved in your political system from your school board. Yeah. It, it, it's so much more important and has such a greater touch the closer they are to you. Your town council, your school board, your, your state representative, right? Those are the people that are making the most effect in your life. Yeah. And if you look at the number of laws that are passed at a state level compared to the number of laws that are passed at the national level, yeah. how many do you think affect you? Right? Yeah. So it's, it, it, get involved no matter what you believe. Yeah, that's how I feel. Whether you're on my side or not, do at least if you're active in it, I can at least believe in what you're doing then because you're pushing for it. If you just sit back and complain, you're not doing anything. You're not trying to affect anything. You're not telling anyone your story. You're not making a difference. No. Either. You got to, it, it starts with the basic vote. Yeah. Right? And if it truly affects you, get involved. Yes, exactly. If you have children and you don't like what's happening, then get get involved. If you have a business and you don't like what's happening, get involved. Get out there and start using your mouth because, and then actually do something with it. Put some time behind it. And if you have money to give, then do that. You know, whatever God's given you for your options, do them because you need to help because it's not a one person thing here. That's how we get railroaded because these people that have power take over and then we just have to live with the rules. Exactly. And it's not, and not money, good. Money's power, yeah. right? And so even, you know, you're a mom, you've got, not you, no, yeah, but, I <laughs> but a mom with two kids that's, mm -hmm. that's working a job and everything else. She's like, how do I get involved? You know what? Send an email. Yeah. Pick up the phone. Tell that representative from your perspective why you believe what you believe and why you're going to vote based on your beliefs. Yeah. Right? It, it, so it's as easy as a... 15 second, 20 second phone call to your representative to let them know how you feel. Yeah. It's as easy as an email that says, please vote no for this. Yeah. And, and hopefully they'll get them from both sides. Hopefully they'll become educated on yeah. the situation. Hopefully they'll be able to come up with solutions that, that involve both sides. So yeah. as a business owner, right? I'm sure that when you make a decision, you seem like the kind of person that takes everybody that's affected yeah. and involved and the stakeholders and you say okay i have a big decision to make here how do you guys feel about it yeah how's it going to affect you what's it going to do that's what our representatives need to be doing yeah right they're supposed to represent no matter who voted them in office they're supposed to be representing all of us and if they if we don't tell them what our perspective is and if we don't tell them what our um how we're affected by what they're doing they'll never know Yes. Well, I think that's in general in life. I mean, any relationship, if you are having issues, you need to have communication and mm -hmm. tell them this, what you're doing is hurting this or hurting me or whatever. And that's how you start to get change. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In my business, I mean, obviously we as the owners, we have to make the final decision. Correct. And we will weigh all the options. And sometimes it's not what everybody wants, but sometimes they have some saying of like, this is, and I want to get other people's perspective because I need to know if we make a time change or we make a decision on how we're going to cut stuff different or whatever, what does that do to you guys? How does that affect you? Because there's things I don't think about. And I'm like, I mean, you brought tons of stuff to me today that I would have never thought about. And I'm like, that kind of changes my perspective a little because I see something that I didn't see before. Right. And that's why I think it's good to talk about this stuff. Well, and the, I, I know so much about it because I've talked to people, right? Yeah. During 124, 5, and 6, I traveled the whole Western Slope to talk to anybody involved in the industry and that's where i learned right yeah. how they were being affected mm -hmm. that actually was affecting farmers it was affecting peach growers it was affecting hops growing it, it, but it's so hard to to have your mind go that far down and so yeah. it's a little bit like um i'm gonna buy my wine at the grocery store well it saves me a little bit of a time but you don't understand the trickle down effect of that yeah exactly yeah, I mean, I think it's great that you're out here talking to me. You're talking to other people. You're educated. You've, you're in this industry. This is your life. And this is why you know so much about it, because right. this is what you do. This is your livelihood. And so um, 
for time's sake, we're at almost an hour here. And like I said, I'm always happy to, if you have any other things on this list I gave you, we can talk about, but I think the direction we went is where we were supposed to go and I'm content with it. Is there anything else that you want to add? No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah. Um, I think, I think all of us need to do more of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, because how do you know how, if you don't, you know, when you go to a restaurant or like, okay, so we'll go back to liquor. You're sitting at the yeah. bar and if you're sitting on your phone and you're not talking to, talking to the guy next to you, how are you ever going to know yeah. what they, what they are, who they are, how they're affected or what life is, or, you know, I think we're just all diving into our electronic holes to a certain degree. Oh, I absolutely agree with you on that. I think it's destroying the families. I think it's destroying us as people, marriages, relationships, because we are stuck. We're ding led, as they say. Like every time that phone rings, I got it. What, what's going on? You know. And I mean, I am young enough. I was in high school when my first cell phone came out, and it was the, you know, the stupid thing with the huge antenna, and you couldn't do anything but call people. And I had gotten one because I was driving late at night to work after school. My brother was worried about me, so he's like, "Get a cheap phone so you can at least call." But it has changed so much now because we're on it all the time. Well, and. <laughs> we could talk for another hour on this, but we're also <laughs> manipulated by our beliefs, by that, okay. by that device, Yeah. right? It's algorithms, Yeah. right? I search for, um, we're renovating a house down in Hotchkiss and you know, I search for kitchen things and then all I get is kitchen things. But right? you only see what they show you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that that has to do with all of it. So discussion is amazing. Yeah. Getting back to talking to people, like you said, getting out with your business. That's why I like what we do is we get to talk to people. I mean, people come in and yeah, we sell them a shed, but we talk about so much stuff. I get into politics. I get into what they're doing, their life. People have stories, told stories about their children dying. I mean, people are hungry to talk to each other. You know, I'm a believer and I believe God made us to have other people to, to fellowship with and talk to. And at the end of the day, like you said, if we stay in that device and we only get our news and information off of that, we are being led by whoever's controlling that site. Right. Right. And so I think that's a great point that you have there. You're so smart. Uh, <laughs> well, we're mammals. We yeah. <laughs> need each other, right? Yeah, we do. We need time with each other. We need fellowship. We need, I guess, just perspective because you have a story that I don't have and, you know, vice versa. And I can learn so much from you as a woman, as a business owner, mother, whatever you all are, because you've experienced things I've never experienced. And I think that's what makes people so great. If we come together and we're stronger together. And I think we get so divisive on everything. You know, we don't have to agree but we can try to at least understand each other's perspective and how it affects each other. Yeah, I think we've gotten to a time where it's, if you don't agree with what somebody says, the wall goes up, right? Yeah. And I'm gonna go back where it's more comfortable where everybody believes what I'm yeah. believing. And it just, you lose so much. Yeah, You lose their, their life experience that you could do and learn about. You could lose where they came from. I mean, we're all, it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, their story alone can change your life. I mean, I hear people talk sometimes, and I'm thinking, like, it puts me back in perspective of, like, my life is pretty damn good, you know? Sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I spilled my toe and I did that. But I'm like, no, this guy has no legs. I mean, this guy's <laughs> telling me in person how amazing his life is, and I'm thinking, what in the hell am I bitching about? You know what I mean? So, yeah, I think that's a good point, too. And that's why I kind of want everyone listening to go out and talk to people and talk to your local business owner and talk to the guy who makes your bread and go to the local businesses. And if you're in Silverthorne, go to uh, local liquors. liquors. Thank you. Where you want to give the location? Because we all travel. Um, next time I'm through there, I'll have to stop in. So you, uh, exit into Silverthorne, go north, and we're two blocks on the right. On the right. Okay. Yeah. And it'll be. It, it, you should check out the store. We. It's. It's. It's a little bit of a unique one. We now sell local meats that are produced. So you by... still have the deli and all that? No. Because like, we never did even get to finish that. But... No. But at, okay. um, so we shut down the deli and we went to liquor only. But okay. at that point, um, we people had gotten used to buying their steaks at our place. And so sure. we've dove even deeper into locally sourcing. Like our meat is Highland cattle just raised just oh, north wow. of town. We do um, a meal prep system called Prefair out of Denver that um, that you make your meal in 15 minutes. You can order it just like a Hello Fresh, but it doesn't travel from across the country. How far away it's can you ship sourced. that? We're working on it. <laughs> you have to keep me updated because I actually use HelloFresh because I don't. I work all the time. I don't like to cook, and so I want more information on that. I, I will definitely pass yeah. it on, um, but. So again, you, you, you got to walk the walk, talk the talk, you talk yeah. the talk, walk the walk. It's, yeah. um, but we try to source locally wherever we can. So local meats, what else do you have in there? Um, so there are a couple restaurants that produce product for us. So there's a young man out of Breckenridge 
who just took over his mom's company called Soups On. Okay. And so he pa- he he went and got USDA approval. He now packages his soups and sells it at our place. Um, a local ice cream maker from down. Wow, you Denver. have a lot in there. Yeah, I mean we do, we now source eggs, cheese, and milk out of Olathe. Okay. So that people have an opportunity to, you know, stay local, and I mean I, I truly believe in it. I didn't even realize all that, so I'm glad we're still talking because I have specifically I know there's furniture haulers that listen to me on here, and they travel from Minnesota out to California. You guys have to stop into local liquors because I'm gonna have to stop in there when I go through Denver. I did not know you have all that stuff. Yeah. What else? Did you, anything else that you can tell me about? Um, let's promote your store a little more. <laughs> uh, you know, not not really. I mean, okay, we but get, I love we, the local because and we we get super involved. We have a one of our best one of the best things that we do in my eyes, is um, a few years ago, the town of Silverthorne came to us and said, uh, we we want to do a First Friday series. So the okay. first Friday of every month, do some sort of event, some sort of something. They said, do you, can you think of anything? And I said, I always wanted to do a locals appreciation party. Okay. Which is basically a party that you do when there's not tourists around mm-hmm. and you just tell local people that we could all get back and see each other and have a good time and stuff. And so this thing has evolved over the last seven years into, um, it's a free event. We have local breweries, wineries, and distilleries that come in. They donate their product, they donate their time, they donate their people. Um, We have a couple local bands, and all we do is ask for donation at the door. And And this is held at your location? It's held across from our location, at the Performing Arts Center lawn. Okay. but people can donate a dollar, they can donate a hundred dollars, they can donate five dollars, and a hundred percent of what we bring in goes back to five local charities. Oh, that's awesome. And then leading up to that, there's a whole thing in the industry now called allocated bourbons and allocated beverages. And so a lot of people resell them and they get resold on the on the online and stuff for a lot more money. Okay. We collect all ours, we put them on auction, and a hundred percent of what we bring in on those also goes back to the same five local charities. Okay. But what's, you know, it's it's super cool. because When do you do this? It's the first Friday of every May. Oh, every May. Okay. So, every May's first okay. Friday. Okay. And the auction starts in mid-April. But we change the, we keep a few of the, um, of the uh, beneficiaries and nonprofits the same, but try to highlight different things they do for the community. But then we also try to bring in new ones every time to create awareness for what they're doing for the community. Do you mind sharing the last ones you used? Oh, geez, I'll always forget one. Um, <laughs> FERC's Rental Assistance Program, Mountain Mentors, which is um, a, uh, an organization that helps um, people coming into the country that, to try to do things the legal way. Okay. Right? Um, oh, geez, who are the rest of them? I apologize. I put her on the spot you here. You totally so. put me on the spot. <laughs> and that was in May. Um, Building Hope, which is a mental health awareness. Okay. In the past, we've done Submit Advocates, which is a program for domestic violence. We've done Cafe Food Rescue, which basically takes food that's not used by convention I centers and stuff, and yes. they repackage it and put it back out into the community. Okay. So there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of really cool okay. programs that we've been able to help, and it's small. But do you realize the impact you have on that? That's why I like small businesses like you, because they do things like that that help the community. And you're doing it every year. And it's not only brings your community together, but then you actually have a reach out. to You don't even know who you're all affecting with that. Correct. And the cool thing about it is that it also takes the community that I work in, which is the breweries, wineries, and distilleries mm-hmm. that are all local, all from Colorado, become a part of it. They donate too. True. You know, so all of us come together. And it connects them, and then they can start to, you know, figure things out and talk. And right. you're building a network of people, and networks of people make change. Right. I mean, believe it or not, we all sometimes think we're just so small. We're who we can affect. You never know. Right. Because one person could come to that, or one person could listen to this. That could change so much stuff for us because they have more power than us, or they know more people, or they just have a big fat mouth and they tell everybody. Right. right? So. Well, and we couldn't have done it without the town of Silverthorne and the partnership there. So, you just, you know, you kind of figure out who has like mind, like. Yeah. So Silverthorne's been really good to you guys as far as a business helping you along the way. and. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, that's huge because some cities are not easy to deal with. No, no, yeah. no, Silverthorne, Silverthorne's great. They really are. <laughs> they care about small businesses. They And more importantly, they've 
they care about the community. They have decided to become, they realize that they're, they are going to have second homeowners. They realize they're going to have Airbnb and things like that, but mm -hmm. they are making a very concerted effort to make sure that they are the bedroom community and workforce housing. Good. And a, an affordable place to live. So it's a, a perfect storm, right? Yeah, because it's all those mountain towns around, it's got to be expensive for people. Oh. I always wonder how do people that work in those towns afford to live there? Because it's so insane. Well, so like one of the things that we do is we give a locals discount. Oh, okay. So anybody that's local or anybody that's even working there mm -hmm. that like we'll have crews from Grand Junction come up and work. Yeah. We'll give them the local discount. Oh, that's cool. Because it's not necessarily about what your address is, yeah. but it's about what you're up against. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and it's about it's about like the expense of living up there. It's yeah. crazy. Well, I love that your town helps you. We we moved out of Fruita because they just would not. We wanted to. We had to grow, and we had outgrew our building, and we had bought property. And I was told through the city that like, yep, you can build what you're looking to do here. We get into the process, and nope, they. I mean, they just destroyed us. Like, we could not. What they wanted, we were out in the country. They want all these bike lanes and all this crap. And I was like, no one's gonna ride their bicycle out here. Like, I have to have bicycle parking. All this stupid crap. I understand there's rules for the in-town people. They made it so expensive. I had to sell that land. I ended up buying here in Junction because they just destroyed us out there so and i love fruit i love the people i used to live there it's a fantastic community but they they like the big people costco's coming in they're giving them millions and millions of dollars i mean it's insane they help these huge corporations but they're forgetting about the little guys here right it's like so, it's like in sales tax incentive yeah right yeah guess what target you don't have to pay sales tax for 20 years yeah. right and it's like who can afford to pay sales tax target not yeah me exactly <laughs> right it's the most so. frustrating thing yeah yeah and it's when silverthorne the, the the people that work there they they have a good they listen yeah right they understand that it's not cookie cutter when i love that you have the people there that care about their community because they understand what business does what people like you do you know right and so I'm thankful that you have that and, and then that you're willing to sit here and say that because they need the props for that. And so, yeah. no, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy that we established business where we did Yeah. for a lot of different reasons. Do you think long-term that's, how long do you plan to stay in the business? If you don't mind me asking, you don't have to answer that, but, um, you know, I'm slowly working my way into retirement. Yeah. I, I don't want to be sold that I can't enjoy it. Yeah. Um, do your children want to take it someday? No. No, they're happy out. <laughs> yeah, that one, tends to be what I hear. One, yeah. one, one, one is a very successful salesperson here in Grand Junction, oh, okay. and the other is um, going back for his master's in biology. But oh wow, okay. you know, they they both have spent their time working in the yeah. store and everything else. But I have a manager um, that is like a son to me, mm -hmm. as, as you said, most of my yeah. all my employees, right? Um, and he and two other employees are on ownership programs oh okay so they'll get a percentage of the company um after a certain period of time one is because how else do they get started right can you yeah can, i don't i'm glad you brought that up because i want to ask you about that because i think about that from my company i have no children you know i'm i'm only 41 i have plenty of time to work but like i think about those questions like what do you do how because when we bought our company thankfully the owner he did a um like he carried the loan for us and we had it paid off in two years but like that's a little scary because you don't know how that's going to go so can you tell me a little bit what you're willing to share on that ownership plan how does it work what's it look like so uh my manager is on a 10% ownership program. So okay. every year, at the end of the year, I bonus him, I might get my math wrong, like 2.5%. Okay. I give him in a bonus. Mm -hmm. Then he pays, he puts that check back into the company okay. to buy the company. Buy ownership in the company. Okay. Correct. And so after, two, after five years, he vests. Okay. And so I double his ownership. Okay. And so then he'll become a 10% owner. Okay. So it does a lot for both yeah. of us, right? It, um, he has a stake in what we do and, and the success of the company. Mm -hmm. um, I have an um, amazing employee. And he has, you know, if I decide to sell, then he gets a 10% payout on whatever I sell oh, it wow. for. And then he can go off and do what he wants to do. Or he can, you know, decide he wants to, to increase his percentage of ownership mm -hmm. as I move out. But... It's so hard to get started these days. You would yeah. know that. Yeah, You're it small. is. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm thankful for Dave because he took the risk. I mean, obviously, we had many conversations and he just felt like we were the right people. And it was, thankfully, the right people to work together. But I am terrified of the thought of like, 
borrowing some of your money and they run the company and they could totally ruin because i've heard stories i know people in fruta that's happened and i know people that like the people that bought it ruined the business they never paid them now they get this business back that's ruined has a terrible reputation it's scary because yeah. you are putting so much of yourself i mean i've owned this eight and a half years you've owned yours a long time you know, for me, I don't have children, so my business has become like my children. I mean, I know it's kind of stupid to say, but it's real it's for not. me. It's yeah. not stupid at all. Like you said, we spend a ton of time with them, and yeah. you want to be with people you love, right? Yeah, and, exactly. Um, but for me, it was it was finding somebody that cared as much about the business as I did, right? Yeah. And wanted to learn and wanted to vest himself in it. Yeah, I think that's um, a great and smart way to do it. Because he has to keep earning it and he has to keep investing to keep it going, which then helps him long term and helps you. Correct. Yeah. Right. And then we have another. So I also loan him the money for the taxes on the bonus. Okay. So, so he doesn't have to. So that he that. doesn't have to. At the end, then we'll all come even on it. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't do it without, uh, you know, without Robbie, without Eddie. The, the, the team my managers it's yeah. it's a team right and yeah uh, i was talking to a human being last week and she was saying you know they're a new franchise here in town there's she opened two at once and they're younger you know the first business and she's got that same problem she's getting burned out because she's running everything she's the manager she's everything i mean she has employees but they're like college kids and you know and i kept telling her like you've got to get out of that because she can't, she's having her time trusting which is so hard to do especially as a new business owner and what you're saying, you need that team to support you because you cannot do it by yourself. And you can grow to a point, but then you're going to stagnate and you're going to strangle your business because everything cannot go through you eventually. Like you have to change you'll, it. You'll burn out, yeah. right? Yeah. It just, and then it's no fun. Yeah. So is that kind of what you, because you're smiling, you seem to still love your business all these years. And <laughs> she's like at a point where she's like, I love it, but I hate it at the same time. Where are you, how did, was it just getting that team is what kept you going and loving it and dealing with all this craziness of the, you know these regulations and it's um i like the industry mm -hmm. i really like the people in the industry yeah especially when it comes to local like i love the local entrepreneurs i love the fact that i had a farmer or a rancher from grand junction come in the store the other day and he's like oh you sell local meats he said can i have my wife call you will you sell our stuff and i'm like yeah yeah know, that's great so all that it keeps me going mm -hmm. right i don't I don't want to just be selling somebody shots. Yeah. I want to be part of the community. I want people that want to come to work. I want to be creative. I love change. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you can't change, then you can't survive. Yeah. Especially in, in, in an industry like ours that's constantly changing because of laws and things like that. Um, and is that what inspired you to bring the local stuff on was the change and trying to, you know, evolve with what's going on in the economy and the business? And I, we started, um, we got deeper into it, yes, because of that, because of the loss of wine revenue. Yeah. We got a lot deeper into it, but we've always done it. Okay. And we've always felt really, it's really important when a local, somebody local comes in and says, will you support what I'm trying to do? Yeah. It's like, hell yeah. You're actually helping launch their business. Right. Which is, that's why I love the small business coaching I do, because there's people that just have no idea where to start. And, you know, I don't know everything about everything, but I know the basics and I can get you going and then we learn together and I help you. And most people just need to believe in themselves. People are so beat down and they think they can't do it. And just having someone believe in them changes it first off. And then just knowing some of the stuff to at least even give them direction of like, I have a lady I'm dealing with, she's doing a coffee truck. I don't know food and beverage rules, but I know the direction we've been sending her in and let's go talk to these people and figure out what they're saying you have to do and the permitting and you know, you get so overwhelmed. So for you to even open your store to let them start selling there is helping them to start their business and grow right. their business. Right, so if they can, you know, Five bucks, five bucks, five bucks, right? And it puts a little in your pocket. Right. Why not sell some of their meat? It makes you some money. Right. So. And it's a better meat than yeah. you're getting at the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> yeah. Where you don't know where it's sourced or how that cow's been treated or, you yeah. know. Yeah it's got to be happy it's living in Colorado right I know it's such a beautiful I grew up in Minnesota so <laughs> I oh love my. Minnesota I grew up in Iowa yeah but uh no it's it's all about helping your neighbor yeah right no matter and and we've kind of lost track of that no I think we have I think we're such a it's me mine and what is that saying me mine and my four or something like that and I'm just so not that way because I don't have children to protect so I'm always protecting my people and I look around at my employees and I'm looking at how much they care about us and we care about them. And then I'm looking at their kids and the next generation coming. And I just keep thinking like, how can we make things better for them? You know, because sometimes I think 
I can only affect these guys. Well, that's fine. I have six people right here and then their children and families that I can affect and they're going to remember how they're... I always tell people for me, I run my business as honest and as great as I can because I want my people to go home and not drink every night and not beat on their wives because they're freaking miserable. And I want them to go home and love on their family because they had such a great day at work and I see that and it just... That's what makes owning a business so great, I think. Oh, yeah. It's the effect. Yeah. You spend a lot of time at work. Shouldn't be someplace you hate. Yeah. And no. corporate, I just, I've never had to work full on corporate since high school. You know, I've always worked small business as before I owned my own businesses. And I just look at how those people, you know, poured into me as a young person and gave me opportunities to show what I could do. And there's something about pride of that. Like, I think we lose shape of pride and, and not in a pride that's bad, but in pride of like, I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of how I take care of my employees. I'm proud of what I'm building here. You know, and I'm proud if I take care of my customers. One of my last straws at a corporation was I was given 3% of my payroll budget to bonus my employees, Okay. right? Mm-hmm. Well, I interpreted it as I have a lump sum of money. Yeah. And it was 3% raises, not bonuses. Okay. Um, I have a lump sum of money to work with, and I'm going to bonus people accordingly. Yeah, so, according to what the, how good they do, right? Right. Yeah, who earned And so it. I had a receptionist that was making 20-something thousand a year. Okay. And I bonused her 6%. Mm-hmm. And I had somebody else making 80000 a year, and I bonused them like 1% or 2%. Yeah. Because one, you could see the, the difference in the employees and what they were doing. Yeah. And I got cut. I really? Mean, they didn't like co- that? No, corporate says 3% to everybody. And I'm like, but wait a minute, 3% of $80,000 is more than this person That's has crazy. worked for. But this person's really worked. She makes no money. So even if they weren't very good, you had to give them 3%. Correct. See, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> no. Well, and 3% of 80 is so much more than yeah. 3% of you know $26,000 a year. But this, this employee was working her butt off for me. So, and the company. And you can't reward hard work, which as a small business owner, I mean, obviously we have laws we have to obey by, but I, I make the rules for the most part in my business. I'm going to make sure if you're doing a great job, you're going to know it and you're going to be paid well for that job. I think we've taken away so much of hard work and like be proud of what you did and reward people for that. It's without getting political. It's so much like everybody gets the same. And that's not, where does that, where does the drive to do better? Where does the drive to invent new things? I mean, like, how does how does the world work like that? Like, if we're all the same, we get paid the same. That doesn't make me want to work hard. I mean, that's like, what I don't get recognized for putting extra hours in. Or, or how about a creative idea? Yeah. Or a new way to make money. Or Innovation, you know. yeah. Yeah. What it's, happens there? It's crazy. It's we're, we're living in such a weird world. I think we have very similar beliefs here. Um, is there anything else you want to add to this? No, I appreciate the opportunity. It's, yeah. it's, I had no idea what to expect, but it's been rather enjoyable. Yeah, I try to make it fun because we got to talk about stuff. I learn. I, I don't know everything. And I love learning from women like you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for running a good, honest, hardworking business. Thank you. Um, I will send everybody I can over that way. All the people I know traveling through Colorado, I'm going to make sure they stop there. And I'm going to stop next time, and I'll hopefully see you in there. And um, if you know anyone here has any questions or anything, you can email me at Light Up Your Business LLC at gmail and if there's anything you want to say to her or get uh, information to her let me know and i'll get it on passed on to her uh we thank you all for listening and if you have anything else you know always get reach out to me i'm always promoting business if you guys want to be on the episode if you want me to interview uh you can send me an email and we'll get you on here thank Thank you very much thank you thanks and remember in the world of business every success story begins with a passionate dream and ends with a strategic billion dollar handshake stay ambitious stay innovative and keep making those deals that reshape tomorrow thank you all for tuning in and until next time remember proverbs 3 3 says let love and faithfulness never leave you bind them around your neck write them on the tablet of your heart that way you will win favor and a good name in the sight of god and man And remember, if you like what you heard today, click the follow button so you never miss an episode. Are you ready to take your small business to new heights? With Faithful Coaching, you'll receive personalized guidance rooted in both practical business know-how and deep faith-based principles. 
Picture this, achieve your goals with clarity, purpose, and unwavering faith. That's what our expert coaches specialize in. Whether you're just starting out or looking to expand, our tailored coaching programs are designed to meet you where you are and propel you forward. Say goodbye to overwhelm and self-doubt and hello to confidence and success. Join the Faithfield Coaching family today and step into the abundant future you've always envisioned. Visit faithfieldcoach.com to schedule your free 30-minute consultation. Let's make your dreams a reality together.